Hey, everybody. I think I am live. Welcome to Q&A Wednesdays with Darcy. Do you ever get heartburn? It's probably not for the reason you think. Are you using too much toilet paper? Why that is a message from your body trying to tell you about your health. We're going to talk about some really fun stuff today on this live Wednesday Q&A with yours truly. I'm so happy to be here with you. And um, as usual, I got to scroll here for a second, make sure uh, I can see where your comments and questions might come in. Hello, hello. If you're here live, go ahead and um, just tell me where you are. Say hello. Um, it's good to be with you. And I really want to just get started. We've got quite a few fun topics to cover today. Uh, most of them things we only whisper about to the people most intimate with us because these are things that are sort of considered inappropriate for polite conversation. And I think we're past that. I think we know that we're gonna to have to talk honestly about our body and all the things that it does or doesn't do if we really wanna to get to the core of, um, of our health. So I'm here for it. I'm here for a paradigm change, actually. I'm here for a paradigm shift away from symptomatic thinking to root cause thinking and that is going to be the only path forward if you want to have a thriving human body because what happens uh, most of the symptoms in our bodies things that we consider discomfort um, illness disease dis-ease being not at ease in our body these words that we use um, again if we kind of get down to the roots you can see where they're pointing um, most of the problems in our body are actually just our bodies trying to deal with a bad environment, with something happening to it. Um, nine times out of 10 in my work, that's a bad environment is the diet. Now, there's also things we do to our body through um, exercise, not resting enough, not getting enough recovery. Uh, not sleeping enough. Definitely we have toxins in our modern world that are impacting our body in negative ways and, and definitely the body talks to us about that stuff too. But the place where most of us have the most power and it's enough, it's enough to cause huge transformations when you just begin to look at what you eat, what you're putting in the body and how your body responds to it. So we're going to go right there. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to talk about this question. Actually, it wasn't a question. This thing about heartburn. This was a client that I work with and actually I got this from two places this week, which is always how I kind of choose my questions. A lot of you will send in questions and the topics that tend to come up that I realize I'm teaching the most on, I really wanna bring forward into this public format to share these insights with people because a lot of us are confused. Okay, heartburn. Hands up, how many people have experienced heartburn in your life? How many people have experienced heartburn this week? Okay. How many of you experience heartburn on a regular basis? How many people have come to see heartburn as just a normal, inconvenient, unpleasant, but normal part of life? So I usually see a lot of hands here. Now, it's probably not for the reason you think. A lot of us think that heartburn comes from eating spicy foods, and um, while that can sometimes be true, if you get heartburn after eating pizza, it was not the peppers on your pizza that did it. It was the carbs in the pizza. And let me explain. Um, first, so this came from somebody who said to me this week, oh my gosh, Darcy, you know, following more and more of my recommendations that I give to people people feeling better and better, people getting more and more in touch with their bodies, and then they're gonna have these aha moments, like, oh my gosh. What she said was, I, for the first time in a long time, I had a cookie. I didn't even eat the whole cookie, and within a couple of minutes, I noticed immediately this flash of heart, heartburn, the burning. And she said, like, could that be? I mean, does a cookie cause heartburn? Well, yes, because carbs cause heartburn. All right, so I'm just gonna give you a minute to like process that for a minute. Cause again, a lot of people are going like, what are you talking about? It's spicy food. Everybody knows it's spicy foods that cause heartburn. Well, if you ever eat that spicy food all by itself, you're gonna feel the heat of it. You're not necessarily gonna get heartburn. 
where you get heartburn is where you're eating what we think are spicy foods that are really carb dense foods things like pizza and pasta right okay that spicy stromboli sandwich well that's like you know that's 100 grams of carbohydrate in there let me explain why okay so what happens is your body is meant to digest food through and i'm not going to go into a whole lot of scientific detail here i'm going to make this very simplistic okay it's probably too simplistic but i think it will help you get the idea and then what i hope it will do is inspire you to pay closer attention maybe even do a two-week carb test for yourself see if you can figure out what your carb tolerance is and then notice like so many of my clients do i talked to a woman again today who's like oh heartburn oh i forgot i used to have that right so here's what happens when you digest food digestion happens at a couple different phases it begins in your mouth with your saliva um it's going to pass the food's going to pass down your esophagus into your stomach a lot of digestion will happen in that stomach and we even call it stomach acid right so there are there are a lot of enzymes that come on board that are going to begin to um, do their action of breaking those food particles into smaller and smaller bits until we actually get down to the molecular compounds and we're going to be broken into amino acids and fatty acids and glu glucose molecules so enzyme action does a lot of that typically that first phase of digestion in the stomach that needs to be an acidic environment we've evolved that way for a whole host of reasons um, some of which are because of the foods that those early humans took in um, that acidic digestive environment helps to break down those foods best it also does not allow certain um, uh, pathogens so microorganisms that we do not want um, to, to enter our body that acidic environment does not allow them through it kills the back the bad bacteria um, so there's a lot going on there so what happens actually when we eat a diet high in refined and processed carbohydrates what we are doing is eating a diet that is way out of alignment with the way our human bodies evolve to eat we all know the starchy processed sugared up carbs those are a modern invention um, they lead to modern diseases and what happens is those um, the polysaccharides basically the all the carb molecules they're not broken down or digested the same way as other simple foods like proteins fats the the non-starchy vegetables like leafy greens that kind of stuff um, they're not broken down the same way they require a different uh, environment to break them down that's one of the reasons a lot of us get gas as well so heartburn is only one symptom of a poor digestive uh, process gas burping bloating all of those things tell us that digestion is not happening as it should it's not being efficient a lot of that is because we're eating too many processed carbs they're not broken down well in the acidic environment of the stomach um, they require different kinds of uh, enzymatic processes to get those polysaccharides busted apart and usable. A lot of that's actually going to happen a little bit later um, in the intestines. So these things take longer to break down. They're not as easy to break down. They don't break down in the same environments that the other foods do. They create more of an alkaline environment in the stomach. So what happens is you take in all those carbs. You had an acidic, well, maybe you had an acidic stomach um, or if you've been eating carbs like that all day every day for most of your life you've actually created a digestive system that isn't acidic that isn't going to work now the body knows this the body knows what its set points are what it's supposed to the way it's supposed to work so here's what happens you take in the carbs that acidic environment and I've got help here um, that acidic environment isn't going to break them apart um, it creates more of an alkaline environment. Now the body then gets triggered to say, whoa, alkaline here in this phase of the stomach, that's not supposed to be. We're supposed to have an acidic environment here. We've got to kill off uh, possible pathogens. We've got to break apart. We've got to get the enzymes activated. And so the body knows this, sends a signal that, there, that the stomach environment is too alkaline. And so it releases, what do you think? more acid it's that triggering effect of the body trying to balance itself by releasing more stomach acid that we then feel as
cause heartburn. We're feeling it. And so what do we do? We say, oh, I have heartburn. That's too much stomach acid. I'm going to take something to neutralize it. I'll pop, you know, a Tums, something alkaline, something. And you get this vicious cycle going where we're alkalizing an environment that's supposed to be acidic. The body keeps trying to make it acidic the way it's supposed to be. Send more acid, make more acid. We are feeling the, uh, the immediate effects of that and not putting two and two together. We're treating a symptom, we're attacking a symptom instead of treating the root cause. Well, wait a minute, Darcy, what do you mean treating the root cause? Well, I mean stop doing the thing that causes the heartburn. Am I suggesting you not eat pizza? Not if it gives you heartburn. Am I suggesting you don't eat that cookie? Not if it gives you heartburn. And I see, as I say some of these things, I get viewers come on and then the viewer numbers drop and maybe people are called away because they have other things to do and maybe not everybody's ready to hear this information. Maybe not everybody is really ready to take full responsibility for their health, for their nutrition, for the way that their body feels. Maybe it's easier to go and get a pill so that we can keep unconsciously doing the things that we're doing unconsciously. We do them because everybody else is doing them, because it looks normal when everybody else is doing it. It's on all the commercials. It's in every gas station you stop in. There are at least you know 17 different great pizza restaurants in your town, and Tums are readily available. And let me just ask you, is that really working? Some of us will end up late stage Acid reflux issues, we're going to end up on phar real pharmaceuticals to fix it. We might even end up at a gastroenterologist who's going to suggest um, really powerful medications and maybe even surgery because what's going to happen over time is that excess of stomach acid that is a natural reflex of the body trying to balance itself, that's eventually going to erode tissue, right? Do we all know somebody like that who's had to have that procedure? My dad was one of them. And it's not something, it wasn't something wrong with his body. It wasn't something that, that he was destined to have, something wrong with him that we need experts to step in and help fix these defective bodies. It is literally as simple as what we're feeding ourselves. And then the way the body responds to that, that creates a symptom. And instead of really listening to that symptom, doing what the body is asking for, less alkaline food in here, please, less processed starchy carbs, please. I can't deal with this. I'm trying to keep up with enough acid. This stuff isn't being broken down in my natural acidic environment. I've been creating this naturally acidic digestive environment for eons and all of a sudden I'm being asked to adapt and I can't do it. And we take that message from the body and we just try to silence it. So I'm going to give you a metaphor here because I'm in a myth busting kind of mood today. So I'm going to give you a metaphor. Let's say that I take a hammer, whether on purpose or on accident, I'm, let's say I'm building something and I smash my finger with that hammer. And now my finger really, really hurts. And furthermore, it's bright red and probably puffy. Well, I could look at that and say, wow, it's red. It's not supposed to be red. I don't want it to be red. I'm going to just, what could I do? I could paint it. I could put some skin color paint on, paint my finger. Right? And then if I did it again, hit with a hammer, oh. Now I can still paint the color, but now, I mean, it really is big. And it's painful. And it's big. It's bigger. I don't want it to be bigger. I'll just put a glove on it. And then I can't see that it's bigger. And then if I hit myself with that hammer again, do you get my point? Like if I just keep trying to make it look normal from the outside in and I don't actually deal with the cause, which is I am smashing my finger with that hammer. If I were to stop doing that, do I, do I need to fix the discoloration? If I stop doing that, do I need to hide the fact that it's swollen? Like where are we going to just get really honest with ourselves and say, I actually have the power I'm not powerless. I'm not dependent upon these experts. Um, I have the power. 
I'm, I'm smart enough to sort of sit still and pay attention to how I feel. And I'm smart enough to slow down a bit and notice what did I do and then what happened after that. The people I work with, they're doing this. They're doing this work. They're noticing when I eat that cookie and I feel heartburn for the first time in two weeks, that's a pretty clear cause and effect. And so the answer was yes, a cookie can cause heartburn. It's caused by processed starchy carbs. I am not here to tell you that that's how it is for you. I'm here to invite you to test that for yourself. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Do a two-week carb test. See how you feel. See if it improves. Reintroduce them. See how you feel. See what happens. See what your body is saying to you. That's what I invite you to do. Um, this whole idea of burping, of gas, of bloating. Uh, I just got off the phone with a private client a few minutes ago. She was like, that was who I thought I was. Just this constantly sort of gassy person. Like that, she had even evolved personality traits around, because there's a little bit of shame in sort of being the noisy one or knowing when to leave the room to let your gas escape in ways that don't embarrass you in social situations. Even around, among the people closest to us, this can be embarrassing, right? Um, we have to worry, does it smell? Does it make a sound? You know, it, um, the hilarious line from uh, the bucket list where, what is it, uh, Jack Nicholson, does he say like something that he's learned in his old age to never trust a fart, right? So where are we on that journey? How normal is this? I'm just here to say those are all normalized signs a very poor digestion, very poor digestion. And please don't feel shame if you have heartburn, gas, burping, uh, bloating, um, farting after meals. It's just your body talking to you. It's your body trying to say, what I'm working to digest right now isn't really happening efficiently. It's not really working. And again, if you don't believe me, I invite you to test it and try it for yourself. Um, and there's no shame here. You know, a lot of people think that, um, for, so for example, beans, we think beans, 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 the magical fruit, the more you eat, right? Um, and that that's normal. Well, it is normal to have gas after eating very starchy foods that you don't digest well. Point blank. And so if you are fine with that and you're fine with that message from your body and you're going to ignore it and carry on eating those foods and you're fine with that, I'm, I'm not here to judge you. But what I am here to say is like a lot of my clients come to me with these things. These are symptoms of carbohydrate intolerance. And they come to me with this list of symptoms and we work um, through a, a program that teaches them what their carbohydrate tolerance is. And yes, it does involve some elimination. It's not deprivation. It's a short-term elimination to let the body balance itself so that we can see um, what that tolerance is. And then they come back to me and they're like, oh, I forgot I used to have that. Oh my gosh, I've been feeling so much better. I almost forgot. Some people actually celebrate. They're like, I don't have to go hide away by myself after a meal anymore. And that's going to lead me into the next uh, topic or question that I got this week, which was about elimination itself and how normal it is in our culture to have to go spend a, a long time to have your favorite book. <laughs> um, your favorite reading room in the house is probably uh, your bathroom. And uh, not at my house. Okay, so this is going to cross the line for some people. And I, if it does, I, I'm sorry, but not sorry. This is something we need to talk about. The frequency, the character, um, the consistency, the comfort of your elimination is a very, very important sign of your body's health and of your body's ability to digest foods appropriately, completely. Um, so if you're using a lot of toilet paper, that is a sign from your body. If you're spending a long time uh, sitting there trying to have a bowel movement, if it takes a long time, if it's difficult to pass, if, it is, um, if it's messy, if it's extra smelly, yeah, you're gonna notice an odor for sure. 
and that odor is off-putting, that's normal. That's a biofeedback tool. <laughs> that's a biofeedback tool. When food smells good, we bring it into the body. When something smells bad, we keep it away from the body. That's waste. It's meant to be moved away from us. These are our natural instincts talking. The smell should be off-putting. It shouldn't be horrifying, okay? Um, <clears throat> so those are all signs that what's being eliminated, the waste coming from that body, is particularly toxic. Um, and especially if there is a, a big volume of waste, all right? So everybody needs to have an efficient, comfortable bowel movement every day. Um, but this idea that we need to have two or three of them, uh, I'm going to call BS on that. Um, a lot of that is actually related to unhealthy digestion. And that unhealthy digestion starts with what we're asking the body to digest. Okay? So what I want you to do is to consider... Um, paying attention to these signs of digestion yourself. If you've just kind of been on autopilot and um, the heartburn, burping, gas, um, smelly, multiple stools, you know, if that's kind of a norm in your life, then um, you're definitely going to notice a difference when you do a two-week carb test. For some of us, that carb test has to last more than two weeks. Some of you are tired of hearing me talk about carbs. That's fine. You can go your own way and eat your cookies. I'm here for the people who are really ready to make some changes and really want to look at root causes because that's what it is. There's not a whole bunch of other crazy things happening that we need to um, buy stuff to fix. You don't need to buy anything to fix these issues. You just need to look at the foods that you're eating and change what you're eating to be more in alignment with what your body is naturally asking for. Okay, let's talk about how this relates to the gut biome too, because everybody's heard about taking probiotics now, I think, and that we need a healthy uh, gut microbiome. What that really means is that you've got a, you're a host. <laughs> you are an Airbnb host to a bunch of bacteria, and you want to set up the best environment for the best guests to come and live there and thrive with you. And I stole that metaphor from one of my clients who is actually kind of dancing around, singing to herself that she's a vibrant woman now and she is um, creating herself to be this beautiful host for a healthy gut microbiome. Those bacteria do many jobs. I'm not gonna go into all of it right now, but they basically, they protect our gut lining from being permeable. Excess carbs, grains, and legumes are the are the top offenders for creating gut permeability, always, otherwise known as leaky gut. Um, it's the biggest cause of what we call IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which is basically enough inflammation that you can't digest your food correctly. And one of the major symptoms of this is either um, too loose stools, so chronic diarrhea, or chronic constipation, the other end, or it, for a lot of people, and what my daughter had before she was diagnosed as celiac, was an alternating between those two. So you get diarrhea for a while and then you're constipated for a while. And what that is, is the body trying its best to balance itself, um, digesting foods that really don't work for it. And what happens then is this gut microbiome becomes out of balance. So we end up with either not enough of the good guys, too many of the bad guys, or basically a combination of both. So the, the gut but, um the bacteria, the gut microbiome, will help to create um, an impenetrable layer. The cells of the gut lining are only about one cell thick. And so we really need them to have good tight junctures. We need the bacteria to be um, full and efficient in there. What they do uh, when they're living a happy, healthy life in there, they're creating the neurotransmitters that feed our brain, um, that are the basis for our hormones, that, um, boy, it's, I mean, I... There's a lot. There's a lot going on. And per pound of body weight, most human beings um, are a very high percent. A part of your body weight, a big part of your body weight is actually your gut microbiome. And it's important. So what I want to say is when we're eating, we're doing more than just feeding our bodies. We are actually feeding those um, bacteria, okay, in the microbiome. And what we give them determines whether they thrive 
and if they're thriving, they give us the chemicals for our chemical factory that we need. They also participate in our digestion. So if they're off, our digestion is off. And that's what I wanted to say. This idea of heartburn, um, particularly of burping, bloating, gas, and poor elimination, whether it be too loose or um, too difficult, those are all signs that your gut microbiome is off and we need to restore it. A lot of people will turn to probiotics and I, you know, I'm not here to advise people whether to do that or not to do that. I invite you to learn more about it. What I want you to consider is that even in that situation, I want you to look for root cause, okay? So even if you introduce a whole new colony of beneficial gut bacteria through that pill that you're taking, that you spend a lot of money for, by the way, those things are not cheap. They're pricey for a reason. They've gotta be kept cold, the whole time we got to keep them alive there have to be the right balance they have to be enough different strains of them remember diversity is important so even in that environment they thrive in diversity you don't want just want all the same uh, species in there that's a monoculture and it's not good um, so the idea is that even if you recolonize with healthy bacteria and you don't feed them or you keep feeding them the same diet that killed them and led to the imbalance to begin with where are you? Where are you? You're back in the same situation. Minus your $56 on your big bottle of probiotics. So what I want to invite you to do is to really keep thinking root cause, all right? We've got to eat in a way that will naturally support um, the thriving of our microbiome. So eating foods that are more natural. What do I mean by that? I mean um, unprocessed proteins. So animal proteins, this is your eggs, your steak, uh, your fish, um, yes, pork chops, chicken, lamb, uh, beef, whatever you feel comfortable eating within your budget, your morals, your values, unprocessed um, animal proteins. I also want you to eat um, healthy fats. What are the healthy fats? Well, they're, they're the ones that are, first of all, not um, engineered in a lab, so not margarine, nothing hydrogenated. I want you to eat fats like animal fats, so you can eat lard, butter, particularly if they're grass-fed. You can eat olive oil, coconut oil, avocados, nuts um, in moderation. Nuts can lead us to some of those uh, polyunsaturated fats. Do not eat all of those vegetable fats that come in the clear bottles. They're going to go rancid. The body doesn't use them well. Um, they lead toward inflammation. So avoid the safflower, sunflower, corn oil, all of that. So you're going to eat unprocessed proteins. You're going to eat healthy fats. And you're going to eat abundant vegetables in a variety of colors. That's the basis for a healthy human diet. If you have tolerance for carbohydrates, then you can eat as many of the natural carbohydrates as you want up to your tolerance. And how do you know? Well, you're going to watch for the symptoms. Um, I've done many posts with lists of symptoms of carbohydrate intolerance. I've talked about some of them today. I talk about it pretty much every week in all my live Q and A's. This, this is the hill I will die on. Um, I've seen the impact, the transformational power of understanding personal carb tolerance. And that doesn't necessarily mean low carb. It means your personal carb tolerance. It's probably lower carb than what you've been eating. If you're on a standard Western diet, it doesn't necessarily mean low carb. And um, all the folks out there that are trying to tell you what number to eat at, don't listen to them. Do a test, find out for yourself, listen to your body. It can change over time. Exercise, metabolic muscle, activity, your sleep, rest, stress, um, all of these things, the weather, the amount of sunlight you experience, all of these things will impact your carbohydrate tolerance. And so that is something that nobody else can tell you, but you can easily find out for yourself. Okay, so yes, I, this is the hill I will die on. Um, it has absolutely saved my life, saved my daughter's life. Way out of the range of our instincts and we need to get them back. It's the most powerful, most efficient way I know to get them back is to do the two week carb test. If you want help with that, I absolutely offer that as a mini coaching package. It's part of all the work I do with my private clients and um, there, I've got free resources. If you're in my Vibrant Woman community, if you're not, let me know, I'll send you an invite. That's a free community we did. Um, there's some free resources in that group. We did a group 
carb trial challenge um, last year. And you can come in and take a, scroll through that group and take a look at what's there to help you if you want support. So absolutely, um, this is the root cause. All right, and I'm just here to do a little myth busting around popping pills and masking symptoms when the truth is you have the power to treat the root cause and transform your entire life and your health and the vibrancy in your one human body. All right. So I hope that um, addressed a couple of the, the questions that I got this week. I hope it satisfied your curiosity. It's something we hadn't really talked about that openly before. Of course, if you have any follow-up questions, I'm always delighted to take those and, um, and to talk more about anything with anybody one-on-one. -on -one. You can come set up a free discovery call with me, by the way, and see if my coaching programs would be a good fit for you or pick my brain for a little bit. I'm always happy to help get folks on the right path to thriving in their bodies. Um, and with that in mind, let me tell you what, what we've got coming up. Next Saturday, the 20th of August, 3 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, because I'm in the Eastern Time Zone here in the U.S., we are going to meet for a label reading workshop. And I'm going to teach you how to read the labels on food, like is there sugar added? How do I know? What if it says natural? What's the difference between free range and cage free? And uh, hormones added or not added? Why does any of that matter? How come it says no sugar added and all the, has nine grams of sugar? Like, what are they doing on the labels? They are up to something. Um, it's a, not a very well-regulated uh, part of our lives, especially here in the U.S. Abroad, it might be a little better. But anyway, we're going to walk through what to know about the food labels, um, how to know which stuff you need to put back, what belongs in your cart, your home, in your body, the bodies of your children. Um, you know, whatever you feed your children, you're building their body and building their brain. And we feed them breakfast or we don't, and we send them off to school where they've got learning and memory and development to happen. And as a mom who fought for years to help her child um, heal a brain injury and become capable of all of these, you know, high-level um, human functions that we expect of adults in our modern world, you know, I worked hard for that. And uh, I've got some some tips and tricks up my sleeve to help you make sure that you're at least keeping your kids' brains healthy. If they were given a healthy brain to begin with, good for you. Let's keep it that way, all right? If you got a kid who struggles to learn a little bit, this workshop is definitely for you too. Um, if you don't have any kids, this workshop is for you. You're buying things, bringing them home, and feeding yourself. And at, at the very least, you can be well-informed to know what you're doing there. By the time you leave that workshop, you're also gonna have a menu of breakfast ideas. Um, for yourself or your family and an idea of why breakfast is the most important meal of the day and what you can do to set yourself up for success. So I'm really passionate about this, maybe you noticed. And uh, so we're gonna do that workshop. Watch my page, uh, stay tuned. The registration link will come out today or tomorrow and um, the spaces will be somewhat limited there. So if, if you think that's for you, please come on in, jump on in and, and get yourself a spot saved and we'll meet together next weekend and dive in. I'll have a bunch of labels. I've been taking pictures at the grocery store, so I'm gonna show you a bunch of labels, all the stuff that you're probably seeing there, and we're gonna decipher it, okay? There will be time for questions, and I think that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Oh, if you want to be the first to know when registration opens, come on, I'm gonna put the link right over here right now. Go ahead and come into my free e-newsletter uh, subscriber list. It's I send newsletters once a week often they have recipes in them um, and other great health information you'll be the first to know when I offer programs like this too so come sign up and then you'll get the registration link right to your inbox okay it's the best way to do it all right beloveds this was a little myth busting I'm, I was in a mood for that today I really hope this helps you to think a little more deeply about really what's happening with your body I really don't want you to think of your body as something that you need to struggle with or fight against, basically. I want you to see your body as the beautiful ally that it is. I mean, it loves you. It is here for you to live your life through this body. All of the cells of your body conspire every moment of every day without really much requirement from you that you even cooperate or participate, it's, it's doing its best at all times. 
to keep you humming along, to keep you going, to let you experience this beautiful life on this beautiful planet at this time, to let you love your people, to do your creative works, to invest in your communities. It all happens through your body. And all it's asking for is, um, you know, a little attention to the right foods, the right care, and you can do that. And I'm here to invite you to do it and ask you to join me. All right. I'm sending you all my love today. Hope to see you again soon. Join me for that label reading workshop. And until next time, be well. Bye, everybody.